are you like a, a big dude like for doing that to someone like that like like you that's ridiculous like these people it's like some innocent guy that wouldn't hurt anyone in a strimal you're gonna like punch in the face or do something like, like how ridiculous is that it's My guest today is Moshe Reuven, a Hasidic hip-hop musician, rabbi, and the CEO of a successful tech company. Having had his debut single top the charts internationally and with over 2 million followers across Instagram and TikTok, Moshe has gone from strength to strength. And most recently, he released a single with Julian Marley, son of the reggae legend Bob Marley. Moshe, thanks so much for joining the podcast. How are you doing? Thank you. Doing well. Thank you guys for having me. Not at all. Um, I, I really want to, you know, thank you for making this happen. I want to thank Ellie Goldsmith from Unity Bookings for making this happen. He's been very helpful and he can be reached um, on, on Unity Inspires Projects at gmail.com or Instagram at Unity Inspires Projects. So you are a Hasidic hip hop artist, which is, I, I think, fair to say, pretty unusual. Have you found that perhaps due to your, uh, or due to preconceptions either of Jews or, or hip hop artists, people are surprised when you when you tell them what you do? Yeah, um, it is more shocking, I guess, when people uh, you know see that I am one a Hasidic Jew and also I'm in the genre of hip hop. Um, definitely a novelty, but it's. Um, in a positive sense, I think, you know, they kind of like, oh, well, I guess not all Hasidic Jews are the exact way that I perceive them to be in my mind. Hmm. How, how did you first get into hip hop? So I'm a ball true, meaning I didn't like grow up um, religious, you know, so basically um, it was part of my upbringing, you know, like it was part of my, you know, it was part of you know, being a kid in the secular world, you know, like that, you're, you know, pop culture, hip hop is the number one genre in the world, you know, uh, more people listen to hip hop than any other genre. And uh, it's more prominent over the past 20, 30 years than any other genre as well. Um, so any person, you know, individual has hit, you know, if you're not a religious Jew, has been influenced in some way or seen some way pop, uh, hip hop and rap and whatnot. So it was definitely, um, something I always enjoyed growing up. I never really like perceived it as like any type of lane that I would be involved in. But, you know, as I got older and, um, you know, basketball was my extracurricular activity was basketball was less of a priority. And we were involved in other things as being a teen, um, you know, that became a hobby of mine, I guess you'd say. And uh, over time, a bit of an obsession that I would be writing constantly um, outside of class and outside of my work that I had to do for school, um, outside of social life. And part of our social life also, I'd, you know, it became part, you know, something that I was really involved in. Mm. Who, who who did you grow up uh, listening to? Who were some of your inspirations? Oh, wow. I guess uh, that would depend on the time of my life. <laughs> um, you know, I would say all like the notable artists in the genre, you know, uh, from, you know, the 90s, 80s to today, even though, I, you know, those aren't necessarily my time period as much. Um, I was born in the 90s, but, you know, not, not it wasn't so shy to be listening to it when you're, couple of years old. Um, but I would say that like, just because being a hip hop head, so to speak, interested in the genre, liking music and uh, liking that form of music, you, you know, looking back, I, I would always like study it and learn, you know, listen to different artists that people weren't listening to. Um, but I wasn't only interested in hip hop, I was interested in all genres. Um, you know, uh, especially as I bridged from like high school to college, um, I started listening to like seventies music more and oldies and things that, you know, I kind of grew up on, 
you know, for my parents, uh, you know, and uh, more like the previous generations, uh, more influential type of music. Uh, because I felt that there was more meaning to it, more substance uh, than what a lot of what was coming out in hip hop at that time, especially. Um, and uh, kind of just, you know, I was just always interested in different forms of music. It wasn't necessarily just rap. So my my inspirations are all across the board. In every genre, there's probably someone that I could say that I have some form of inspiration to, to create music from. Hmm. It's interesting because, you know, being a hip hop head, you'll know a lot of, um, you know, I think it's fair to say a lot of the, the lyrical content in, in hip hop can sometimes issue towards, how, how to say, I suppose like money, women, drugs, lavish lifestyle, that sort of thing. How can um, a religious person maintain their religion and be involved in their religion with all their heart as well and also enjoy these, these these songs is it possible well i i think i mean there's a difference between creating and in, ingesting you know uh i wouldn't suggest people listen to most hip-hop music <laughs> i personally don't you know if I, I so like i can't say that i would say i'm a Hip hop activists, because um, I'm not. I most of it is not the proper morals, not the proper things, especially for a yid to be focused on and to want to grow up to be a light unto the nations. To be hearing so much about the darkness in the world is not, and uh, it's not conducive for that. Uh, what you intake, you put out, you know. So I have like a head there where I'm allowed to like look back at different songs that or artists or whatever, even if they're not necessarily the type of music a Hasid should be focused on for, because I, it's one of my revenue streams of Parnassa. So I'm allowed to, you know, and then technically you're allowed to listen to non-Jewish music. Even uh, it's not always suggestion. Um, but, uh, you know, as long as there's not a lot of the negative things in it. So like if there's curse words or whatever, even Torah would say like, most of the hip hop music is trafe. You can't listen to it. You, you're, you're, every other word's a curse. Every other thing topic is something that a person shouldn't be focusing on. So, um, I wouldn't say that you could, uh, but I would say you could create it. You could create, like, if you are, that's the type of music you create. It's Kleepa Snoga in a sense. Music is neutral energy. It depends on what you do with it. You could bring light to the world with hip hop, but ingesting the type of music that most people are creating in that lane, I wouldn't suggest necessarily because most of it is probably not good for you. Well, well, your music is, is quite inspiring and, and uplifting. Um, and I'm wondering, does that make your music stand out in the genre? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think so. I think also because like the way that my music's coming across is, you know, people of all types could listen to it. Um, whereas I think that any time that they, this has really been done, I think you, there are Christian, like, for example, we're not, we're not a Christian, but oh, there are Christian, you know, hip hop channels, for example, on the radio, you know? Um, so it's not like a, it's not like it's not ever been attempted before, but those, that music is usually niched within that group of people. You know, it's not something that people beyond are necessarily going to listen to. So I think the beauty of the type of music that I've been coming out with is that it's good for my niche and it's good way beyond. It could be where it could be anyone in the world could listen to it and appreciate it. And that's why I have very diverse people um, following and interacting, reaching out to me. You know, they might not be Jewish. They might be in another country they might be even like interested in hip-hop or they just like it because it's more i think it's more a little bit so i do think it, it is a it is a positive thing that is uh unique in the genre not that that hasn't been done but i think that the way that it's been scared the way that it's scaling beyond is uh is a bit unique thank god 
Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, your songs, You Are Not Alone, for example, very um, unifying, very, very uh, holistic, I thought. And I, I want to know where, where do you get your inspiration from? How do you sit down and write a song? And does any of that come from your Judaism? So, yeah, I, you know, ultimately I, I try to make it that every concept that I write about it has like, if it's not just coming from life, because, you know, a Yid's life is Torah. It's, uh, it's, it's connected with the, you know, it's part of they, they every, every, every person has a, a note in the Torah, so to speak. So if it's not coming from life, it's still coming from a citizen. If it's even coming from life, it's, kind of connected to Hasidus and Torah and wisdom and, and that's in the Torah because I try to write things that I personally want experiencing and seeing and and how I'm relating to that to God and my, my mission in life and what I'm supposed to do. So I think that ultimately like the backings of it, the underpinnings of it are in Hasidus and Judaism and Torah um, I'm just bringing myself into that and ex being honest about my expression about, you know, good or bad necessarily, like, and how I'm relating to what I know is right. Yeah. I, I, I think it's really interesting. This this sort of, uh, this idea that some, some lyrics are trafe and actually, um, if we look at a lot of hip hop, it's, it's, sometimes it's worse than trafe, you know, anti-Semitism in hip hop has been a longstanding issue, um, you know, from troubling lyrics regarding Jews and money to the anti-Semitic tirade from the rapper Wiley a few years ago. Um, I want to know, why do you think that anti-Semitic tropes have become so prominent in the world of hip hop? Uh, I have like three answers to that, but I'll start with the fact that <laughs> um, when you look at a record label and all the prominent record labels of today, which the top artists come out of ultimately for the past 30 years are all the top artists have been coming out of mainly the top labels. It's a new phenomenon that independent artists are making it really big. Um, but the being that being the case, who owns runs the CEO, CFOs, executives, decision makers of all those places, a lot of them are Jews. So these people that come from a completely different background and they see, you know, who's the guy that, you know, cuts my check and decides what I do and all these things because I, I work for the label as an artist. Uh, it's, it's a Jewish guy and it, it creates a lot of animosity, especially because a lot of artists get into deals that they don't like. They sign a deal when they just got big and then, six years down the line, why do I have to be bound to this deal that, you know, like why, why, like I could be making so much money. You guys are making so much money off of me. The Jewish guys, are, you know, in the back office is making way more than I am hypothetically speaking. Like that's what a lot of hip hop artists feel. And it's not, and then it's not always towards a whole group of Jews. Um, so some of it isn't always like we hate the Jewish people. Some of it is, you know, and some of it is because of those scenarios, they do hate the Jewish people, certain people do. But I'll just say that um, obviously the Wiley thing became much bigger. That is actual anti-Semitism. But sometimes it just comes from a scenario where a person doesn't like, you know, financially how things worked out. And that also has caused problems to the Jewish people. We talk about Nazism and Germany and, you know, they didn't like that Jews had most of the jobs financially you know just because it doesn't always come from a really well-founded place where they really hate jews it doesn't necessarily mean it's not a problem so it is an issue um but i don't think it always comes from like real uh real deep-seated hatred i think it comes from relationships and that might cause certain hatred uh when you hear it in those in in hip-hop especially Mm. I, I actually don't disagree in terms of uh, a lot of the time it comes from they're a bad feeling about one person they might know. But I think the concern is when that goes into a song that then gets distributed to, to millions of people and their fans and they don't make it clear that they're talking about one guy that can be super um, damaging. Like a lot of people who listen to their music can think, oh, yeah, the Jews do this. Da, 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 da. Yeah, no, I mean, that's definitely the case. And that's why it is a huge issue. Um, 
that that is that is a huge issue and i would say that's what you know I, what wiley got his twitter taken down and his everything taken down because what he was doing was that was blatantly aggressive towards the jewish people but i think you know if it does seem like a person actually is aggressive or negative towards someone like nick cannon or whatever uh for a certain period of time it does it could be it could be detrimental for because more people latch on to that it's the cool thing if you look up to that guy you might act like that you know Mm. <clears throat> one thing I, I will say about Nick Cannon is that he, it, it appears as though from the outside, he did take steps to, to make amends. He did take steps to, to say, I'm sorry, and I want to learn better. And it's interesting because he and Wiley sort of had um, similar situations and they've just gone in totally different paths. Wiley has completely like, doubled down every single time. And Nick Cannon has, has crossed the line and said, you know what? I did cross the line and, I, and I'm sorry. And I'll, what can I do? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it's mature what how he went about it. Obviously, everything he said was ridiculous, but also that's also growing up with uh, wrong information, growing up around people that say things that you look up to that you think that they're correct, and then you realize that after you said it across millions of people, that a reaction I'll calls you for you to be educated because it's just ridiculous what you're saying. I mean, it is it is sad that you know someone else took the other approach i mean you know you i guess that shows the two options that a person has if they ever make such a mistake but it's really easy as a celebrity to make such mistakes but the things that they're saying are not acceptable it's not some it's not like salt, small slights there those are serious statements they, they really are um it's interesting because you, you mentioned we're talking about sort of top labels and stuff. And an article from last year said that you were actually only one of four Orthodox Jews to have signed to a top label. Um, do you consider this an achievement or, or a, a reminder of how far Orthodox art, a Jewish artists still have to go? Um, I think it's both. I mean, I think whenever something becomes more common, that's good in the world. It's a huge thing. But when you realize like there's so few people also, it also shows you like why, but in the same vein, not many Orthodox Jews are creating hip hop music and hoping that that will manifest into something more than just a fun time, you know? So I think, uh, or I mean, I guess, you know, it's not just hip hop music. Those are also artists that are not in hip hop. So, I mean, I guess like, not every it it is common. There's a lot of Orthodox Jews that I know, and you know, in different parts of Orthodoxy that I see that music. Obviously, everyone. Um, but also there's an element where a lot of Orthodox Jews want to just create music for the Orthodox community. You know, so like getting signed to major labels isn't always an agenda for an artist. It's like a well-off dream because I really want to be. They want to be Yaka Shweki or. Avram Freed or whatever, and make music for that community, their community, the community that they're in, and like thought of that. It's like, oh well, if someone appreciated it and want to make it bigger, uh, like Shulam or something, you know, like then that's cool. But um, I don't, I don't know. It, it is interesting, but it also I think there's other dynamics that cause that. You know, it's not necessarily the goal for most Orthodox Jews to be creating music in the to to the secular world unless it's really. That uh, somehow they started becoming accepting of the gunam or you know more Jewish, Jewishly niche music. I mean, in your experience, how has it been? Um, has, have you noticed that your uh, a Hasidic Jew in the music industry is that of note to you, or, or not so much? Yeah, I mean, so you'll find people that don't want the Hasidic Jews to make it over. You know, every almost everyone in in music industry i mean a lot of people in the music industry even like people you deal with that aren't artists wanted to be artists and they weren't able to so they defaulted in i want to work for this company or that company or do something in it because i i have a passion and maybe they didn't manifest the dream to be an artist so at least that's like a second so sometimes you know i've seen a little bit like oh the hasidic jew i'm gonna give him a pass i'm gonna i have some power i'm gonna give this guy over you know the standard and when i personally didn't make it you know god forbid you know so that when they didn't personally make it um so like 
I do see a little bit of that sometimes. It depends on where I'm at, I guess. Um, also, just in general, like, oh, well, you know, I mean, people a lot of times, like record companies don't know what, they, they don't take risks these days. Like, they don't, like, they don't do risky things. They know, you know, I've even spoken to people that involved in the analytics of signing artists and doing making decisions on songs and funding and all those things. And some of it's down to science, like literally beats per minute, every single aspect of a song. Oh, this is what is literally right now going as a hot song if it has all these metrics. So like, I mean, where does an Orthodox Jew, Hasidic art artist come into that picture? I don't know. You know, it's, you know, it's a Hiddish if any, if that's ever happens, because especially in hip hop, who are you going to sign? You're going to sign someone talking about the typical hip hop things or like a, something completely different. It's, it's just, um, I would say that to have an open mind is a little bit harder because the way that record labels are built today, they're not into developing artists. They're into, I'm going to bet on something that is success and is going to continue being a success if we put more money into it. And uh, that's always, that's usually going to be based off the typical like this falls into the typical style of how things work, you know? So it is what it is. You can't control that, you know? So as a, as a Hasidic Jew, you just have to, you know, there's a book like be so good. They, they can't, uh, they can't ignore you type thing. You have, you have to just be XL, you know, you can't, you can't really wait on that. Yeah. I think that's a good mantra. Um, let's go to your latest single that you recorded with Julian Marley, uh, the son of the legendary Bob Marley. What was that experience like for you? That was surreal. I mean, you know, um, I just remember going, driving into high school with my brother, uh, and my older brother and he's playing like Bob Marley and like also in the same probably the same one of those same playlists Maz Jai who came up like two or three times and I was like oh that guy sounds pretty good you know <laughs> um so like it's just crazy to hear like um you know like someone I don't know the Mar Marley's is a huge brand you know the you know there's what like eight brothers and you know some of you know these are one you know one of them I'm, I'm working with one of the Grammy nominated ones that are you know making a huge sound today like um, it's, uh, it's a huge blessing. And, uh, it's also, it makes a lot of sense in my eyes, like too, cause Hasidism is a spiritual thing. It's a, you know, holy thing. I mean, not, not saying that it's the same, but in the, in the regular world, what a lot of people, when they think of spirituality, they think of Marley's, they think of all those things, you know, like that's like kind of the epitome of that. So I feel like it's a good collaboration in that regard because people that are more inclined to that type of thing gravitate to him and, you know, so. Do, do you have any sorts of like, uh, like dream collabs in your head? Yeah. I mean, so I meant to, I mentioned Maz Jai. I, I like, to be honest, like when I became from, like I didn't have anyone to listen to except him. Like I was like, how do I knock out all the music that I listened to growing up and all the music that's available in the, in the rest of the world. And he was religious at the time. And I was like, he's like the only guy that makes something like maybe something like what I'd be interested in. Like, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, that would be one, I'm not going to lie. You know, he was for the the trip that he made for what, 10, 15 years as a, as a Hasid, especially as inspiring for any, any Hasidic Jew and, uh, you know, because no one's, as he's the epitome of someone making it that to that extent. He made it more than anyone else. So also any of those people that like have been signed to a top record company as well, you know, Alex, Claire, Shulam, you know, those are cool people. Um, I'm working on some right now that are dream collabs. You know, I have some dream collabs in the works. So thank God for that. I mean, to be, to be, uh, Stay tuned. I don't know. I can't, I'm not going to reveal all my secrets <laughs> right now, but, um, you know, so I do have some dream collabs. I'd say like, as far as like artists that are not in the Jewish world would be, cause I, I do think that there is room for, for that. Like I could, 
do another collab with another artist that's not necessarily Jewish, that's, you know, established himself a certain lane and has a certain certain listener base that might be interested in something more spiritually inclined. So I think like, you know, Paul McCartney, like the Beatles, like that would be a, a dream. Elton John, uh, Billy Joel, those are like kind of like dream collabs. Um, and hip hop, you know, I wouldn't want to go through all the names, but all the like the big names, I guess that I've uh, been somewhat, I, that I listened to in the past, you know, I think a lot of them, if there's a way to make it in a way that comes out something that I would be approval approving of, like, I think, uh, I think that it, it, it'd be noteworthy. I really am into collaboration. I want to collaborate with as many people Jewishly and, um, you know, the notable people that I think would be, would be, would be useful for me to be collaborating with and not, non non Jewishly as well. Um, so I'm a little bit open-minded and creative about that. So, all right. If any of our listeners are, are listening, Moshe Reuven is looking for collaborations. <laughs> contact. Moshe. Yeah. So if you know any uh, famous hip hop artists, well, connect us. <laughs> um, so I mean, yeah. I mean, there there's definitely people that are in similar genres, similar vibes. That even if they're not Jewish, um, if it's this notable person like Julian, you know that I think that we could do something special together. I definitely, well, I want to, I want to pursue that. You know. Mm. Well, it sounds like you're already tr- you're carving out this niche vibe of like soulful, spiritual hip hop music. Um, is that something that that's just sort of happened, or did you know before you started this is the vibe I'm going to go for? I think it's something that just happened because there's a lot of other songs that I could have came out with first that I would have been working on or had f- finished. And uh, I think the, it was Bashir the ones that were chosen, and I think that it's it's uh it's helping me and you know a lot of times when major labels um would uh, develop an artist the way that they do it is you release a bunch of things to try to find your voice a little bit so i think it's a little bit of epitome of what i've been doing is kind of figuring it out from seeing the reaction from this style or this type of way of communicating myself or whatever and the ones that are to come not all of them are the same vibe not all of them are um and then you say positive, whatever, some of them are more like dealing with the struggle, the darkness, but in a way that brings, brings something to light, you know, it's may not always, may not every song may be like more uppity. I, I think some of them will deal with life struggles because I think that's life. I think that, I think as an artist, you know, you have, you have a, you, the, your best of a voice when you're real and and expressing things that are honest and true from your perspective whether they are always bright and glo- glo- uh, glorious or gloomy you know like so um there's good, definitely songs that i'm quite wondering about how the reaction will be because there's not necessarily always like the same style as what's come out so far but yeah i think i am discovering a bit more and i think part of every release will be more of a discovery about okay not that one maybe this style maybe this style or yeah, like that that has its place, but not everywhere. This is where I'm generally am like, so it'll be a journey. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And I think you're an interesting character because in addition to music, you're very multifaceted. You're also the CEO of a successful tech company. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that and, and how that started. Yeah, so, um, so I started off in the tech space in college. Um, I was in the accounting program at UCF, and um, but I never really wanted to be an accountant. I just knew that accounting is an essential part of business to master, and uh, you know, to be a CPA would be useful also. Or you know, for as a, I was I had aspirations to be an entrepreneur like since I was a little kid, really. So. Um, I mean, I started like a company when I was in college and uh, before I knew it, you know, in between my, my accounting courses, I'd be going down stairs in the business building to see a room full of like an office room full of like 50 people that were working under me. And uh, it was, it was a very, very exciting thing to be involved in while I was doing my studies. Um, you know, at UCF. So it, 
it branched off into like a few things that I built that from. I tried to set things up so that I could go to Yeshiva. And my goal wasn't to live in Orlando my whole life. So, um, you know, I tried to make it more of a digital company and we would also be getting hired out, you know, cause I had a team, other companies were hiring me to be like a CMO for their startups and like you managing my team for those causes as well. Um, and, uh, so that led me into also the media space and tech. Um, so when I went to, um, when I, when I moved, um, you know, I, I brought everything digitally, you know, I brought everything digital and the goal from there was just to run everything from a laptop, a phone, wherever I go, you know, to, so that I could be growing as a, as a, as an Orthodox, you know, Jew also, as well as, you know, an entrepreneur and all my endeavors and, um, as a, you know, as a, as a business person as well and all, and the creative and all the other things, music. And, um, basically, yeah, it's, it's developed over time. We've had a lot of success. Thank God. A lot of also, you know, the struggles of running a company, especially when you, uh, try to take it digitally, uh, digital while you're balancing studies so that you could be at, uh, you know, start study at a rabbinical school. Um, which, you know, I felt like, look, I had already mastered to some extent, or at least been able to handle a large group of people while studying accounting. And, you know, I'd say the uh, accounting program is very rigorous, you know, why not, um, you know, be able to continue my Jewish studies and, and do this. So thankfully, I did get to learn for years in yeshiva. And uh, I got smicha at the Rabbinical College of America, thank God. And, um, you know, it was a huge experience and I, you know, kept up entrepreneur, uh, capabilities and have been able to, you know, monetize my, my passion of being an entrepreneur, um, and, and run, run a company and, um, have clients and have systems and whatnot. So it's been a blessing. It's also, you know, been a journey, but you know, it's, uh, it's uh you know i i also believe like my goal kind of and my thoughts kind of were that you don't need to be like just be boxed into like the specific type of way of doing things like you could create your life you could build things especially if you're more entrepreneurial um you know you where you don't punch a clock you have you know systems that build the revenue streams you know um you know, it allows for a certain type of freedom. So kind of my goal was to try to create that ideal life that I, that I, you know, with, with all my endeavors involved. You, you, you've kept, um, you've, you, you know, you're still in the tech world. And I thought this was interesting because in an interview given last year, you were asked about religious diversity in technology and artificial intelligence companies. And you gave an interesting quote, which I, I want to read. You said, I've seen how in life, anti-Semitism can come about in very sly, cunning ways. And when I think of religious diversity, I think of the Jewish people in the workplace. I think of the guy who gets fired because his boss is anti-Semitic. I think of the deals that get ruined because a partner doesn't like that the guy on the other end is Jewish. I think of all the things we don't see on the news that happen far too often. I thought this was really poignant and I thought this was really necessary to say. Um, and it sounded like these observations were made from experience. Can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I can't say those are my exact experiences, but I just know how things work, you know, how healthy people are. And when this is a thing for certain people or when people don't like other people because of they're Jewish or whatever, that it comes out in these types of ways. Um, you know, uh, personally, I haven't had those exact experience, but I just, I mean, as far as I know, but I've seen, um, you know, I've, I've experienced you know, decision making things happen towards me because my because being Jewish or people acting a specific way 
And not, not only was it from someone that's not Jewish, sometimes it's from Jewish people that are not, you know, into the fact that I'm religious, you know, and it kind of like, you know, they kind of created some identity that they don't, they don't want to see that as a success. They want to see that as a failure because it's not the lifestyle that they chose. So they want to try to manipulate that. Um, so I've seen these things in my life and people have acted that way towards me at different times, but not those exact examples, but I just know that it exists beyond just me. Even without, even if those things didn't happen, I would know that those things existed beyond just me. Um, but the fact that I've seen that firsthand in some regard does make it a bit more real that every moment, even right now, someone's, you know, probably making some decision in the business world or other industries towards someone that's Jewish that may not be in their favor because of it, you know. And uh, it's a sad thing. I mean, the fact that there is anti-Semitism, we can't deny it. It's, it's a fact of life. Um, you know, that, that, that uh, there, you know, throughout history, there's non-Jews that hate Jews and even Jews that hate Jews, you know. Um, so, I mean, that's just part of, part of history. Uh, the thing is how we deal with it moving forward and how we, how we, how we deal with the blows. And I think what you guys are doing is one, one really noble cause that we really need. Thank you very much. That's very kind. And, you know, from, from my perspective, speaking to people like you, who's in the music industry, who's in the tech industry, industries, which I, I personally don't know loads about is very illuminating because what you tell, what you say to the world and what, what you're telling us, you know, in, informs how we address things. So, so it's really helpful for us too, when people like you speak out about these things. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, yeah, just, yeah, I think, I think, uh, these things are cultures, you know, uh, you know, being a Yid, uh, from observant Yid, to be observant of our culture, the struggle that we've always had is how does that interplay with the rest of other cultures? And when you're in the working world, musically, technologically, whatever way, shape or form, any industry, you're clashing with the culture of that place and the way that their culture deals with things and acts and promotes others to act. Um, so, I mean, I think especially music and technology, they're very strong cultures today that are highly influential. The tech segment has become the biggest thing over the past you know, 20 years since the dot-com bubble, really. And uh, especially with startup culture. And startup culture, literally, you go into San Francisco, Silicon Valley, you feel like you're in a different planet. You know, it's a different, it's a different world. And uh, music, you know, Hollywood is a different world. Even outside of Hollywood where music uh, is prominent, it's a different world. Any place of music is very impactful on people. And I think as Jews, you know, the only thing that we could do, um, I think it's Ellie Wiesel that says, how do you fight anti-Judaism with more Judaism, you know? By being strong in our culture while we involve ourselves in other cultures in a way that's productive for what are Jews supposed to be doing? You know, um, as long as like with that, that's that's the driving force. That it's a Jewish driving force, a Jewish mindset. You know, and the person could see through the things in that culture that are influencing them to act differently than they should. You know, that's one big challenge. I think that if we do, we will a lot of anti-Semitism. We won't have to worry as much about. Yeah. I, I think this idea of of fighting anti-Semitism by being uh, proud of your Jewish identity is so powerful. It's something a previous guest on the podcast, uh, Rabbi Mordechai Lightstone, he spoke about this as well. He's also in the tech industry. He's also a Hasidic Jew. And he was saying how, um, you know, anti-Semitism, it, getting into flame wars with people online, it, it's not going to do as much as standing proud as as a jew um i i also want to ask you you know as a as a hasidic jew i would be remiss if i did not you know mention that there has been a spike in violent anti-semitic hate crimes against uh 
identifiably Jewish people, meaning you can see that they are Jewish from how they present themselves in the US, in, in Brooklyn, New York, and also in the UK here in, in London, in Stamford Hill. Um, have you, has your community been noticing that? And, and what are your feelings on, on seeing it elsewhere? Thank God we don't have that um, where I am. Um, you know, I think also the, you are, you ever see those videos? How like if anyone that ever had a thought to do something like that to an Orthodox Jew hears this, like you, you you see like the type of people that they're going after too. Like this innocent guy that like he's not going to do anything to you. Like where are you you like what are you are you like a a big dude like for doing that to someone like that? Like like you that's ridiculous. Like these people. It's like some innocent guy that wouldn't hurt anyone in a strimal. You're going to like punch in the face or do something like, like how ridiculous is that? It's like the most bizarre thing. Um, I mean, I think, I don't, I don't know where that comes from. I think, you know, when there's, uh, when there's Ra, when there's some form of evil, like problem is, is that it's so divided. Like there's so many different places that it comes from, from so many people. Um, Thankfully, we don't have it, uh, but I think it's it's quite bizarre, and I don't I don't even know how to how you how you respond to that except by you know showing those people how how ridiculous they look. But I mean, yeah, it's 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 incredibly disturbing. Um, and look, I think one way of doing that is 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 you know talking about it like we are now, raising awareness about it, making sure that people are aware that this is happening. And as we wrap up, I want to ask you something which. Uh, I ask all of our guests, which is if someone says that they want to help in in the fight against anti-Semitism and they may not know loads about Judaism and they may not even be Jewish, uh, where do you recommend that they start? Well, first and foremost, I'd say like before, if you for a Jew, if you want the way the best way to fight anti-Semitism is through, you know, the way anti-Jewish is with more Jewish, with pro-Jewish. Um, so be proudly Jewish. I mean, you know. A lot of people, even like when you hear things about uh, prison stories of the guy that gets picked on, it's usually the guy that's, he, he, he looks like a target, you know, he looks like he's afraid of who he is or, you know, a, pr a proud Jew, I'm just using a marshal, I guess, you know, like a proud Jew is less of a target than, you know, some, not saying that those are the people that are being targeted, people that are not proud, but I'm set, proud, proud, but I'm just saying like, be Jewishly proud, proud of who you are. You know, if you're embarrassed, they, they feel that embarrassment. You know, if you're embarrassed of who you are, then they, then other people are going to feel, wow, this person's embarrassed about who he is, you know. So I think uh, that's one thing. And I, I always felt it was a shame, especially as I was becoming from in college, to see, like, kids that were, like, literally embarrassed about being, doing anything outwardly really Jewish or being outwardly really Jewish because they're friends, like, not that I didn't feel that as I was becoming more from, I, I definitely felt that at times, but because you, you, you don't not embarrassed, but you feel like the opinions of others that you're close to that are not into that. Um, but I just say, you, you know, you should be proud of who you are. It's who you are. And it's a special thing. It's a very special thing to be Jewish. And that's one of the main things and as far as non-Jews, I don't know, other than keeping the Noah had laws, I don't know what they can be doing except really shunning that behavior, that that dialect and making it sound just as ridiculous as it is when they hear it and, and, and people acting that way and defending, standing up for, for, for Jews in whichever way that they can. But, uh, you know, no, being a Noahide, doing the doing the seven mitzvahs with Enoch, the seven laws that God gave to all of mankind, you know, like just doing what God wants, being a good person and standing up for it, shunning the, the stupidity. Mm, all right. Um, Marsha, what are you working on? What have you got coming up and where can people find you? So I'm working on releasing a bunch of songs, part of my, you know, finding more, more about my musical journey uh, for, for, you know, and also uh, giving people more of a catalog to listen to. Um, you know, so I'm definitely planning on dropping a lot of songs. That's one thing. Uh, a music video coming out, my first music video. Um, nice. what else? Um, 
Uh, there'll be other things that I'm going to be launching. So staying tuned to what I'm launching outside of that, that's more creative based. Uh, that's not specifically music. Um, you know, so follow me up. Uh, the main place that I am uh, active is Instagram at Moshe Reuven. M-O-S-H-E-R-E-U-V-E-N. Moshe Reuven. And if you find me on Instagram, you'll be able to find me everywhere else and you'll be able to pay attention to everything else as long as, especially if you turn on notifications and, um, yeah, I mean that, that would be, I would say the, the main place. Mm. All right. Moshe Reuven, thank you so much for coming on podcast against anti-Semitism. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me.